All right, and finally, my favorite or most irksome question is your last. Do we already have? Do we already have? Do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? Why or why not? I mean, like, you've got to be kidding me. That would be, I guess, my favorite question because I'm so befuddled by it. This is Brain Inspired. Hi, Paul. This is Bill in Las Vegas. You ask what is something we think differently about after listening to your podcasts. For me, this is the realization that neurons are not the simple summation devices that we see on artificial neural networks. Blake Richards, in episode 9, talked about segregated dendrites, where he shows how apical dendrites can receive feedback signals, which could allow the neuron to learn without using backpropagation. And after hearing your podcast with Jeff Hawkins, I read some of his papers, where he proposes additional dendrite segregation, splitting basal dendrites into near and far from the cell body, This could provide a way to allow context input to prime a neuron without actually triggering it. Combining those two things, I can finally see how neural networks might do sophisticated learning and retrieval. Thanks for the first hundred episodes, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot of interesting things from your second hundred. Oh no! I have to do another hundred? Catherine! Pack up the kids! And the psychedelics! Let's get out of here. No, leave the dog. Leave the dog. Poor dog. (laughs) Okay, welcome to the final hundredth episode installment here. Uh, I really enjoyed these collections, and I hope that you have as well. So the question of the day that uh, a bunch of my previous guests have answered is, do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? Why or why not? As has been my custom... I will just answer this as well. I say, no, not really, but it's kind of a split answer. I don't think we have all of the right concepts. I think that you can see this in uh, a recent episode uh, with David Cicillo and Omri Barak uh, in the dynamical systems theory framework that's popular right now, um, which I love, and you should too. Um, But even people who practice it, like David Cicillo, who recently articulated this on the show, um, even people who practice it or at least some, see it not as an ultimate explanation of brains themselves or brain functioning to generate mind and behavior, but as something that constitutes progress toward understanding, one way among likely others that get toward satisfying explanations at all the equally special little levels that we talk about. I think it is important to acknowledge uh, how language works, though, how our vocabulary can remain the same while the concepts associated with our words definitely change over time. And that's just the nature of language. It was Brian Christian recently on the podcast who pointed out that even machine learning language networks, um, when they're trained on newspaper articles from last year, say, can have trouble correctly sorting out the language from this year. So that's, again, just the nature of drifting semantics and concepts in our language usage. So in that sense, our language seems to me irrelevant, um, since it will continue to take on and throw away um, you know, changing concepts, even though I myself get plenty frustrated with language usage, since to me it seems to lead to so much wasted time misunderstanding each other. And I think that's probably normal uh, for areas of science where you're dealing with so much unknown and so much complexity. Okay, so that's my little answer. Now you get to listen uh, in random order to many of my previous guests answer that question. So I do look forward very much to 100 more episodes. And I just want to say one more time, thank you for listening. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. Please do consider supporting the podcast for super cheap uh, if you find it valuable. Um, There's various things that you get when you support the podcast. Check out braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. And thank you again to all the previous guests who said yes and showed up to talk to me. Uh, I feel very grateful, and the audience does too. So thank you so much. 
Andrew Sachs here. All right, and finally, do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? I don't think we're doing badly in the sense that I think we are using the vocabulary and concepts that we have so far in, in broadly uh, productive ways. But I, I think we will come up with better concepts. And I think uh, our ability to invent new concepts that clarify new phenomena is underappreciated actually at the moment. So, you know, sometimes people say there's no way to describe what a deep network does in language. That's true today. Right? We don't have the language for it today. But I don't think it recognizes that in the future we can invent new words. And uh, this is just a beautiful aspect of human cognition, right? So, if you think about the gas laws in physics, ideal gas laws, pressure times volume equals nRT. Pressure is natural enough. We all know what that is. Volume, we know what that is. Temperature, kind of have a sense of that. What about atomic number though? You know, there was an epoch where couldn't you imagine someone saying, we don't have the language to describe what gases do. And then eventually you invent the concepts of an atom. You learn about the concept of atomic number. And now it seems routine and we teach it in high school. To my mind, you know, that is going to happen for our deep learning systems and other theories of cognition. And it's a grand challenge that spans neuroscience and AI to find these concepts that we need in order to explain the behavior of these nonlinear, high dimensional learned uh, systems. Thomas Nasolaris, Department of Neuroscience, University of Minnesota. Do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? Uh, I can't answer for we, but I, I certainly don't. I think even my own best ideas, I, I don't really know how to describe them yet. And even when I do have the right vocabulary to describe them, they are probably going to be wrong. So... <laughs> Maybe someone else has the right words, the right vocabulary, but I know that I don't. This is John Krakauer. The assumption there is that there's going to be a set of concepts and vocabulary that will allow you to fuse and subsume talking about the mind and talking about the brain with that one language, right? Now, if it turns out that the question that you're asking in terms of the relevant question determines the language of explanation you're going to use because of what you've decided is relevant, then you're probably going to find that the language and the concepts changes with respect to the level of the question you ask. And so at a meta level, I think the concept in the vocabulary will be one that doesn't demand a single set of concepts or words for a single phenomena, because there'll be multiple ways to talk about that single phenomena. And that feeds back into the idea that this notion would be less hard to swallow if one were to read a little bit more philosophy. Federico Turkheimer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology, and Neuroscience, King's College in London. So the last time we talked, we discussed emergence. And I wrote something pretty basic, I would say, uh, which simply stated that we needed to have a quantitative approach to emergence. And I don't exactly remember when was the last time we talked, but uh, during this time, this has actually happened. And I was mentioning to you that, for example, the complexity group, I mean, there is a group of people interested in complexity science and Imperial, uh, Oxford, and uh, I think Cambridge that uh, have worked out a statistical approach to actually look at emergence, quantifying 
emergent uh, activity from brain, say, standard functional MRI. And, and that has been actually integrated with uh, genetic data. And, um, and I'm, I'm also trying to understand how that comes out of the biology of the brain, which is the bit missing. But at least now we have maps. Um, there is this very f- fantastic map they've shown where they show the two sides of the brain, the very modular brain and the very synergistic brain. And this does correspond to differences in the genetics, genomics, and, and biology of the associative cortices versus the non-associative cortices. And the numerics do confirm that this double-sided um nature of the brain seems to generate the kind of cognition that we call a mind or we call and i'm trying i i'm doing a project at the moment where i'm trying to understand how that could evolve from the primary brain how is that come out what is the mover of, of that of those two sides it's, it must be something simple because evolution ultimately is not that complicated but why are these associative cortices so uh, different? They, ha- they have mo- they have more connected, they have more synapses, they have less myelin than the others, and they are this hat in te- that is sitting on top on something which is more modular. You know, the standard primary and secondary cortices. How is that, is that ha- does, did that happen? This is Steve Potter from the Georgia Tech Laboratory for Neuroengineering. Do we have the right vocabulary? This is question five. Do we have the right vocabulary and concepts to have a satisfying explanation for how brains and minds are related? We probably don't have the right vocabulary and concepts to do uh, have a satisfying es- explanation for how brains and minds are related. We need a lot more terminology and tools that have to do with complex emergent systems and their dynamics. For example, I often hear computational neuroscientists talking about brain states, but this concept is borrowed from digital computers, which actually do have states. Their transistors are either on or off, allowing for a well-defined state during most of every clock cycle on the computer. The brain, by contrast, doesn't have a clock. It does not, uh, yes, there are rhythms and things oscillating in the brain, but there's not a system clock like there is in the computer. The brain is continually changing, continuously changing, you could say. It doesn't go from state to state. It flows, it evolves. So we need more vocabulary to talk about what, for example, does an attractor mean when we're talking about the brain moving towards making a decision or coming up with an idea. I feel like, you know, all the terminology that we have for those right now are the same ones William James was using uh, 120 years ago. This is um, David Krakauer. My favorite, almost irksome question is your last, which is, do we have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? And the answer is obviously we do not. And it's interesting because it's a very old problem and it pops up everywhere. You ask the question as brain to mind, evolutionary Biologists ask the question in terms of life and non-life. Geneticists in terms of genotypes and phenotypes. Computer science in terms of hardware and software. And they're all instances of this same dichotomy between the material domain and the codical domain. And most systems that are functional or adaptive permit of both types of description. And it's interesting, it goes way back. You know, you see these distinctions being made in the Middle Ages by Thomas Aquinas when he's talking about intellectual operation or the soul as being quite distinct from the corporeal world. And that gets in some sense elaborated on 
by Descartes uh, in his Discourse on Method, where he introduced what we now know as Cartesian dualism, where he argues that matter cannot have a perfect understanding of itself. And that has never gone away. And the question is, why? And I don't have an answer. Part of it has to do with a desire to always reduce an explanation to a single epistemological variety. So somehow the material domain is more appealing than an explanation provided in terms of information, for example, or computation, or, you know, logical principles. It, it, it feels more satisfying because obviously the mental world sits on the physical world. On the other hand, most of what we do in our lives when we talk about the economy or history is articulated in these codical terms, and we don't seem to be much bothered by it. And so that's all to say that I think we don't have, as of yet, the right vocabulary. I think Alan Turing, in creating the Turing machine and Alonzo Church in creating the Lambda Calculus, were inching towards what we might need. The Turing machine is obviously a mathematical construct, not a, not a physical one. It's infinite, after all. But it does somehow straddle a little bit of those two worlds. And the key concept for Turing was universality. And I would guess that any adequate explanation of why these two alternative forms of description an explanation have to exist would turn on a concept like universality. So that would be, I guess, my favorite question because I'm so befuddled by it. This is Dean Buonamano. Do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related. Why or why not? Okay, so by mind, I'm going to assume you're including consciousness. And in that case, my answer is a clear no. I don't think we have the vocabulary or concepts. Understanding the human mind and the nature of consciousness is perhaps the most profound of all scientific questions. And it is the mother of all recurrent problems. Um, the brain is trying to understand itself. Um, I think it's a perfectly valid question to ask if that's even possible. Can any device, can any system actually understand itself? We don't expect chimpanzees or other primates to be capable of understanding themselves. And for the most part, we don't under uh, expect AIs necessarily to be capable of understanding um, themselves. So I think this is something that's often not taken as seriously as it should be in this debate. But to see how far we are from having the right vocabulary and concepts to understand the relationship between the brain and mind, one just has to look at the theories of consciousness. While most neuroscientists, certainly myself um, included, believe that consciousness um, and the mind are emergent properties of our neural circuits. But oddly, in some um, well-known neuroscientists um, and some of the most talked about theories of consciousness are panpsychist theories, um, such as integrated uh, information theory, or IIT, um, which place consciousness in the realm of physics. So <laughs> this is a serious reason right why we why we don't have the right vocabulary and concepts so we don't even have general agreement or universal agreement that consciousness is attributable to neuroscience so some people think it's in physics and in my opinion i think this highlights the recursive nature of the task if the brain is to understand itself it has to account for its own limitations and cognitive biases um one of our Cognitive biases is to explain away things that we don't understand through supernatural forces or fundamental forces of physics, like the notion of vitalism or elan vital were used to explain the nature of life uh, at the end of the 1800s. 
So I think, in my mind, panpsychism is more a symptom of how the mind works than a consistent theory of how the mind works. So overall, I think we're a long way, we have a long way to go before the brain comes to understand itself. My name is Conrad Carding. I'm a neuroscientist at the University of Pennsylvania. Last point, do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? Why or why not? I mean, like, you've got to be kidding me. Of course we don't. The, 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 the vocabulary we use now is very different from 10 years ago. Why on earth would we believe that we are very close to solving things? No, no one is even pretending that they can meaningfully simulate the, new, uh, the human brain. We can't really simulate C. elegance for crying out loud. So why would we have the right concepts? Now, I want to go one step further. I think that because we are so strongly on the mechanistic train where we want to understand the brain in terms of the mechanisms there, And because we are so strongly reductionist, we might be missing a lot of the vocabulary that ultimately deals with the objectives of systems. Why are animals designed the way they are? And why, yeah, why did evolution get us there? And that allows us to argue from ecological niche about organization of the brain. And I believe we will need these kinds of arguments. Uri Hassan from Princeton University. <laughs> no, <laughs> like the, the six million dollars question. First, we're still stuck in representations and, and, and operations as class, classically AI systems that we need to get rid of. Now, when you switch representation with embeddings, that some of your audience will know what is embedding is, you start to get to a more dynamical system, but embedding is not enough, right? It, 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 the basis of action, but it's not enough. And then when you ask, are from this like blind embedding and, and direct fit, you get understanding. This is even missing in the current AI version. I think AI systems are more like system one, intuitive and fast and fit to the statistics and act without understanding. You can get a long way with system one, but we also have system two, right? We also slow and elaborate and thinking and deciding, and this is completely missing in current AI. So we're really missing out to get from system one over parameterized memorization interpolation to system two. And that's the big question for, for the coming years. So I'm Rodrigo Kianquiroga, neuroscientist at the University of Leicester. Well, this is a centuries long discussion and, and the one that put it up front was Descartes with his Cartesian dualism. I don't believe in this, in this kind of like essential distinction between mind and brain. I think it's, it's just different levels of seeing the same problem. So sometimes you want to see behavior. I mean, as, I mean, like high level behavior, and this is more or less what psychology focus on. And then, and in some, some other cases, you want to go to the level of single neurons and see more detailed mechanisms and this. It's a little bit more the realm of, of neuroscience, although you can argue that neuroscience can encompass everything because you can also have cognitive neuroscience and so on. So um, I, I think basically, it's, and I'm kind of like starting other, starting other people when I say that, particularly uh, the churchlands, I mean, mind and brain are the same thing. I mean, the mind is nothing more than the activity of, of neurons. And if we talk about the mind or if I talk about neurons, it's basically just choosing the right level of description to to describe or to try to understand some some phenomenon. But I mean, in principle, I, I see mind and brain as, as the same thing. My name is Jim DiCarlo. And clearly, I don't think we have the right vocabulary and concepts because we don't even agree yet on concepts or goals of what it would mean to explain. But I think there's an important thing to think about humans not having a vocabulary to explain something to each other in the terms that we thought we should versus humans having the ability to 
build systems that effectively act as explanations. And those are two different modes of understanding. And it's the latter that I think we need to figure out how to be comfortable with. That's again, related to the idea that things are complicated. Explanations are going to be complicated and not held within human minds. Okay, so my name is Marcel van Gerven. I'm uh, chair of the AI department at the Donders Institute. So I think we have the right vocabulary uh, to describe brains and to describe neuronal dynamics and to uh, to model that. Um, I think that's that's there. But at the same time, we have minds and they basically live on top of those neuronal dynamics, right? So these are uh, uh, cognition is basically defined in terms of symbols, cognitive states, uh, representations, etc. And these things live within the neuronal dynamics, but they unfold at much slower timescales than uh, the timescales you typically associate with uh, single neuron dynamics. So we need to gain an understanding of how these dynamics within neural networks relate to uh, more complicated, stable states that do uh, reflect something uh, which has to do with cognition. And I think people have realized that a long time ago as well, right? So if you look back, there's a lot of work on, on uh, linking recurrent neural networks to nonlinear dynamical systems uh, theory and actually finding descriptors that describe these high le- higher level states that might be more related to uh, cognition in the end. But we didn't nail it. So there's something missing still. Let's take a quick little break and then we'll get back to the responses. My name is Josh Sandeman. My introduction to your podcast was the Crack Hour episode, and that drew me in. Um, You know, I found it to be an incredibly uh, thought-provoking and engaging conversation about some very fundamental issues of how nature creates pattern and the difference between what nature is actually doing in all of its detail and how we're able to model it without losing finding that balance between the amount of detail we need, but also being able to extract the principles. In other, fi- in other words, finding the perfect degree of sphericality of the cow. You know, and that was, I think, one of the big take-home points for me from that discussion. And it just was, it inspired me to continue to follow the podcast. And like I said before, I've, been, I've heard, listened to virtually everyone since and just always been able to take something from it in terms of some of these overall issues, in terms of how brains can exist at all, how they extract information, process information, and then can act upon it, and then how brains can study themselves as a result of that. And it's been very fascinating and edifying. Masrita Chirimuta. Yeah, do I think we have the right vocabulary? No, I wouldn't say right now. I mean, the current like best guess at the right level of simplification for um, understanding the brain has been the computational theory. But I think there are a lot of um, problems with just thinking that computation is going to be the final theory that will unlock all the secrets of the brains, because I think it's bound to miss out a lot of the very important biological details that probably allow brains to do what they do and allow brains to be um, generating thoughts and be the basis of thought and being the substrate of the mind. So I think as long as our understanding of how the brain works is so closely tied to the computational framework, I don't think we're going to be able to make sense completely of how it relates to the mind. Um, Just to give an example, I mean, within the computational framework, people talk about the mind as the software and brain as the level of implementation. So they really directly take those concepts from computer science. And I think there are so many disanalogies between brains and computers that that cannot be the right answer about how brains and minds are related. This is Brad Love from UCL. Do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how the brain and minds are related? Why or why not? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about this, and I think it's somewhat of a red herring. I know your listeners like, you know, philosophical ideas. So, if you just, I mean, look at like Quine and Wittgenstein, like how they talk about meaning arising within a larger system. Um, So, I think that's the same with like vocabulary, science vocabulary, 
I mean, saying attention doesn't mean anything alone. You know, it's within a, a system of other concepts. So, right off the bat, it's not really about vocabulary itself, but, you know, about use and how, how it's used. And for me, these, I mean, in these words change over time. It's not like attention means the same thing now than it does before. The meanings evolve with use and how they relate to other terms. Um, uh, you know, and for me, someone that makes computational models, I, I just don't really care what, what things are called, you know. So, you could say attention's not meaningful or somehow outdated, but it's just a equation you know, in, in the model that's doing something valuable. And if you want to call it something else or not, that makes no difference. So, you know, I think this is really not a real debate or something that we should be uh, using our time on. You know, like as science progresses and evolves, uh, maybe we get a new vocabulary. Maybe the old words change meaning. Some are lost, some are added. But I don't think this is really something that you just go out and try to redo or, or reject. It just doesn't really make sense to me. It's Patrick Mayo. Uh, do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? Why or why not? Whew. I'm one of those people who doesn't really use the word mind. I majored in cognitive science in, in college. And one of the reasons I'm doing neuroscience is because I got a bit frustrated with the, with the word mind and with people sitting around and talking about things, um, sort of like a philosophy class. Uh, so I learned a ton from those classes and it certainly has sparked my interest in how the brain works, but I don't really know what the mind is. There's the mind meld from, you know, the Vulcan Star Trek mind meld. I know what that is, but otherwise I'm studying the brain by doing extracellular electrophysiological recordings and Whatever terms we have for that right now, uh, I'm okay with. Hi, Paul. This is Yuri. What ideas, assumptions, terms do you think is holding back neuroscience and so on? And the other one is related in my mind. Do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? My answer. Neuroscientists began to study the brain buying into a system created by philosophers and psychologists for understanding the soul and the mind without ever asking how those terms whose brain functions we are trying to understand, such as consciousness, were brought into our thinking in the first place. Neuroscience has inherited this paradigm from such philosophy-driven framework, which portrays the brain, or more precisely, the soul and the mind, as a tool to learn about the true nature of the world. Early thinkers used introspection and gave names to mental operations. And now, millennia later, we search for neural mechanisms that might relate to their dreamed up ideas. Of course, an inevitable consequence of this framework, what I call outside in, is the assumption that the brain's fundamental goal is to perceive signals from the outside world process such information, correctly interpret them. In order to respond to these signals, an additional operation is needed. Wedged between the perceptual inputs and the organism response is the terrain of a hypothetical central processor. This is an entity that chooses what to do with the processed information. This poorly understood but often speculated about terrain has been referred to by various terms, such as free will, homunculus, consciousness, executive functions, intervening variables, black box, or more recently, decision maker, depending on the experimenter's philosophical inclination or whether the hypothetical operation is applied to the human brain, brains of other animals, or computer models. Yet, of course, they all refer to the same thing. The key assumption in this perception, decision, action paradigm is that information is processed properly so that something somewhere in the brain can decide to select the correct action. An implicit imp practical implication of this outside-in framework is that the 
next frontier for progress in contemporary neuroscience should be to find a central processor somewhere in the brain and systematically elaborate the neuronal mechanisms of decision making. This is exactly what's going on at full speed in today's neuroscience. Over the past decade, decision making has become a buzz term and applied to virtually all research without pausing a bit and asking ourselves, do we know precisely what we are looking for? In my new book, The Brain from Inside Out, I argue that this outside in framework may not be the best strategy to understand the brain. Brain evolution didn't start out to generate a program where the end product should be the human level cognitive faculties. Instead, brains evolved to induce actions and learn to predict the consequences of those actions as afforded by a particular environment. The brain is not interested in the true nature of the world. Instead, its main preoccupation is to help its host to survive and prosper in its niche. I speculate that this action-centric approach is more strongly embedded in evolution. The neuro neurophysiological findings are more compatible with it, and the problems can be formulated differently, including the problem of the relationship between brains and minds. I suggest that by trying out this inside-out strategy, perhaps some of the currently controversial term may become dispensable. The choice of a particular framework is important in our everyday practice because frameworks shape our ideas, both about experimental design and interpretation. I don't insist that my suggested strategy is perfect, yet I believe that this alternative is perhaps more fruitful than the currently dominant outside-in framework that so strongly influences AI. Peter Ufsoma. So I, I mean about the vocabulary, what, what I can say is definitely the, the way that we talk about uh, concepts like consciousness and attention are really important, but they have a very complex relationship to the things we measure in neuroscience in neurons. Take, for example, um, attention as an example. So uh, when I started to work on vision, I tried to avoid the word attention because I thought it was completely misdefined or at least different, differently defined by different work, uh, workers in the field. And so I thought, let's just not talk about attention because that will make my life easier. But at some point I came to realize that that's not, that's not good because there are many aspects in vision that are really related to how attention works. And there is a very important literature developed by psychologists that use the word attention and there's no way of avoiding it. So then you need to redefine attention because there's selective attention. There is attention in terms of alertness and there are many types of attention. And you really have to keep these things in, in mind if you work on on uh, in neuroscience and try to address questions about attention. Now, for me then, consciousness was basically a word that I then tried to avoid. <laughs> I, I did that successfully for a number of years, but at some point I also realized I cannot avoid it anymore. So, and I think there the, the problem is even more severe. So I, I think even categorizing the different types of consciousness and the different different definitions is still in the beginning. So that will take some time to sort it out. David Popel, and I work at NYU and at the Max Planck Institute. We have the right vocabulary for our particular concerns right now. So we have good vocabulary for certain parts of the cognitive sciences, and we have good vocabulary for parts of the neurosciences. What we lack are convincing linking hypotheses between the vocabularies. So we have coherent hypotheses about the ontological structure or the cognitive ontologies in cognitive science and the biological ontologies in neuroscience, but we do not have ontological linking hypotheses, which makes us ontologically incommensurable. And then it raises questions about where do you start? Do you start with the psychological or computational or cognitive theories or the 
biological ones. Are you an inside out person like Yuri wants to be, or are you a outside in person like I want to be? And where do you meet in the middle? So we have some good vocabulary, actually, some good decomposition of the problems, but we lack the links so far. And let's pay attention to that and maybe we'll hey, move on a bit. This is Paul Chisek from the University of Montreal. Uh, so no, I, I don't. I don't think we quite have it the right vocabulary. I think we are still um, influenced too much by pre-scientific concepts about the mind, sort of assuming that they'll happen to map one to one to real mechanisms in the brain. But I don't think we can really make that assumption. But unfortunately, I think by the time a graduate student has the confidence to question the stuff they they uh, they read in their textbooks or journal articles, they've already spent too much time being an undergraduate student, just absorbing information on how to think exclusively in terms of that kind of stuff. So it seems preposterous to question um, the idea that the brain is an information processing system or that concepts like memory or attention should define our research programs. That's just the vocabulary and the relevant questions are phrased in those terms. Um, but I, I think that some of those definitions uh, might just be wrong, and, and then they lead us the wrong, the wrong way. So, so I think, um, as, as you know, that I think the best way to subdivide the problem of behavior is to do so with the guidance of evolutionary theory, history. So in other words, the definitions are, of functions or systems can be done through the gradual differentiation of functions and systems um, that mirrors how ancestors uh, transitioned to their descendants. Uh, cause, because that's how the functional architecture of the brain was actually constructed. So after all, and I think we all agree with that. So it seems like it's the right way for us to build models of that architecture. And that leads to uh, rather different types of questions. You focus instead on specific transitions that occurred at specific times in our history, uh, doing so from both a neural behavioral perspective. And so the example I'll, I'll use here is related to this uh, question of memory. And, but it doesn't sound maybe like it. Um, so the point is that the example I would give is I think it's a fascinating question of how our ancestors took the hippocampal complex, which evolved over million, hundreds of millions of years in the service of guiding navigation through physical space and at some point started using it for more abstract tasks, including constructing episodic memories of sequential events in our lives. In other words, I think we shouldn't think of memory as some kind of a thing that, some kind of problem, some kind of like abstract platonic solid that our brains finally succeeded in implementing after millions of years uh, of trying different ways of encoding information. Instead, we should think of, of our brain as modifying its control systems in particular idiosyncratic ways that extended specific behavioral capacities like navigation. And at some point, certain things emerged. And you know, some of those things that we call memory is just sort of a phenomena that were produced by that um, gradually evolving system, which is, which is still a work in progress. So so in other words, rather than define the problem to be solved, think about the capacities that uh, modifications enabled and then uh, how those capacities have certain, produce certain phenomena like memory or attention or some of the things that we um, traditionally think about. I think it's possible to sort of reconstruct the vocabulary uh, so that those, you don't start with those things. You start with more fundamental biological uh, processes. Now, most of that is just about neuroscience, right? It doesn't really apply to AI. In AI, if you want to build a system, then how it works, um, how well it works is the most important thing. You don't necessarily have to be concerned about biology. So you could make a memory module and work out how what's an efficient way for it to store information. Um, but I think if you want human-like AI, you know, then you really want to add those additional constraints of biological plausibility. And the way to do that, I think, is to think about some of these evolutionary and philosophical issues that, that I think face neuroscientists. Um, I think they'll provide the right kind of uh, insights for AI as well. Talia Conkle. 
Do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? Why or why not? Yes and no. Again, I think I think there's, I'm going to like just tweak the question a little bit. I think that hidden in the question is a sense that there's the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how minds and brains are related. And I think we need a lot of vocabularies. Um, I think different levels of abstraction are really important. You know, there's some sides that think like, if we, we can build it, we've got a really detailed model, like a computational model that's almost a direct map, you know, sort of silicon implementation of a brain. Well, then we're done. Um, and in some sense, yeah, that's true. You can do a bunch of experiments on it. You can, you can test it. You can make predictions. And I think that is a really useful level of representation and a level of, and a voc, and a particular kind of vocabulary. But, um, I also want a level of understanding that lets me give sort of intuitive answers to questions like, well, how does this work? And why does that happen? And, you know, I kind of want them compressible into simple language and ideas, the kind that, you know, scaffold how we teach the next generations. You know, we talk about dorsal and ventral stream and hierarchy, and these are really compressed concepts that, you know, clearly are making some simplifications, but are hugely powerful for um, situating our concepts for how we think about what the next problems are and, and what are the, what are the problems we need to solve. So yeah, I think you want sort of a multi-scale vocabulary, one that's really detailed and some that are super high level and and really good for sort of conveying broad swaths of ideas in, in a few phrases. And I think that a multi-level vocabulary is going to be really important for understanding how brains and minds and models are related. I'm Steve Grossberg. Do we already have the right vocabulary and concepts to explain how brains and minds are related? Why or why not? Well, as you might guess from my previous answers, I reply, yes. My discoveries with many gifted colleagues over the past 63 years provide insights into most of the fundamental processes whereby our brains do make our minds. There are over 550 articles on my webpage, sites.bu.edu slash Steve G, summarizing these discoveries. But for people who don't want to have to browse over so much stuff, as well as lectures there, uh, let me just remark that an introductory and non-technical overview uh, of these uh, discoveries is provided by my book. Uh, actually, it's my magnum opus that's now in press with Oxford University Press. It'll be published this spring, and its title is Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain, How Each Brain Makes a Mind. All you need to do to get started is to read my book or study a subset of the articles on my webpage that interest you. Both routes should stimulate a lot of thinking and new discoveries. So thanks very much for listening. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.